Hello, everybody. Um, over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk to you about medical treatments for neuroendocrine tumors and with a real focus on potential side effects in their management, which I hope will be very informative for you in your discussions with your physicians. Um, just a quick slide on my disclosures here. And a couple of introductory comments. Um, you know, for everybody out there, ideally, everybody would be cured with surgery alone, right? That's the ultimate goal. We know that often isn't possible for many patients. And it's important to remember that when surgical cure isn't possible, the treatment shouldn't be actually worse than the disease itself. Whenever we think of treatments in cancer medicine, and especially even in neuroendocrine tumors, our ultimate goal is prolonging good quality of life and good quality survival. And how do we do that? We try and control the disease and along with minimizing symptoms or complications from the disease and equally importantly, side effects from the treatment. All right, and I'll come back to this theme uh, throughout the, my talk with you today. Now, there are five big questions that we all as oncologists and when we sit around the table in our multidisciplinary teams, we ask ourselves. So does this patient in front of us need treatment at this time? Some patients with very slowly developing disease might not actually need any treatment and can be safely monitored. It's not just letting people go and waiting for problems to develop, it's, it's managing patients and conditions with routine imaging and deciding at what point treatment might be helpful. A second concept is while a patient is on treatment, is there a change on the scan that's significant enough to change or add treatment? And that's an important question that's commonly discussed. For patients with neuroendocrine tumors, many times the liver is a, is a primary focus of disease. So sometimes we can target the liver specifically. And that should always be thought of whenever we're thinking of adding or changing treatment. And finally, is there a role for surgery and is there a role for PRRT? So five big questions that uh, your oncologists are asking themselves all the time. And our major, one major important concept is really we shouldn't be, we should be treating the whole patient not just the numbers or not just the pictures, okay? So with those introductory comments and during, during the next 10 minutes, I'm not gonna talk about PRT. I'm not gonna talk about liver directed treatment because you're gonna hear about this from others. I'm really talking about medical treatments. And for many of you, you're very comfortable and understand that somatostatin analogs are typically the first line treatment approach for many patients, particularly if you've had neuroendocrine tumors that started in the small intestine and the pancreas. And the three, there are three goals. First is to control any syndromes that might be accompanying the disease, except maybe for insulinoma, which I won't dive into in great detail. The second goal is to prolong disease stability. So importantly, many patients and oncologists focus on tumor shrinkage, but somatostatin analogs don't really do that. They take tumors that are slowly growing and try and make them grow even more slowly. And always to try and delay and avoid complications from the disease. Now, excuse me. So even though uh, the best evidence for patients with small intestinal and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, many times patients with other neuroendocrine tumors also benefit from somatostatin analogs. And it's first line treatment due to the clinical trial efficacy data, the fact that they're very well tolerated in general, and particularly in Canada, they're excellent patient support programs. Usually we think of this for patients with well differentiated disease with a KI67 index less than 10% in general, although there are always exceptions. Many of you know that there are two options, sandostatin LAR, which I abbreviate as LAR, and lanreotide autogel, I'll abbreviate as LAN. Both are given by injections. LAR is given by um, a needle into a deep muscle into the bum. And LAN or lanreotide is given by a needle under the skin, not needing to go into the deep muscle. Now, from an oncologist's perspective, both are very well tolerated, but I always joke with my patients that but it's not me getting the shots in the bum. So it's always in the eye of the beholder. But in general, when we talk of cancer treatments, both of these tend to be exceptionally well tolerated. 
But there are issues. And probably the most logical first to start is injection site discomfort. Many patients report very minimal to no discomfort, but some shots may randomly cause pain. Um, a lot of my patients, we've routinely used something called pain ease or other numbing sprays. And you should talk about this to, for your, to whoever's giving you the injection because it at least minimizes the discomfort from the needle penetrating the skin. Over time, and sometimes again randomly, patients can develop lumps in the area of the injection, and those can last for quite a while. Sometimes there's no pain at all associated with them, but they can get inflamed. And I've often recommended something like ibuprofen for the bad days if that happens. One can consider rotating sites. So most of these injections are given uh, again in the, in the gluteal area, so the bum area, and rights and left are rotated. Um, LAN or somatuline can also be given in the outer thighs. So sometimes there's an opportunity to rotate further if lumps are a painful problem. And some, some ben patients benefit from actually switching from one of, the SS, one of these to the other to try and minimize this issue, usually from LAR to LAN. So issues to discuss with your oncologist, whoever is giving you the injections. Now, apart from the needle, the most probably the most common side effect, uh, particularly when patients start SSAs, is abdominal bloating or growling uh, with new or increase in diarrhea. And the diarrhea tends to be a bit different. The stools tend to be greasier, stickier, perhaps more foul smelling. Uh, this can last one to five days after each injection and usually extinguishes or settles with repeated treatments. And it becomes because both of these can decrease the ability of the intestine um, in absorbing fat out of the gut into the blood. And when fat hangs around inside the intestines, it can cause these symptoms. Many patients have had prior surgery to the small intestine, which can also increase the risk of this being an issue. So I oftentimes will talk to my patients about starting a low-fat diet on the day of injection and for one to five days after. Some patients find that helps. And another remedy that can be very helpful is consideration of something called pancreatic enzymes, which basically are capsules that one takes before they eat. So they're a bit of, a, a bit of an annoyance for sure, that basically replaces uh, or helps the intestine absorb fat and can decrease the risk of this side effect. So again, something to consider, something to talk about if that uh, becomes an escalating problem for you. Um, very importantly, because if you remember, the abdominal bloating growling can come with increasing diarrhea. And if you have carcinoid syndrome, you may think, well, that's my syndrome getting worse. Or your oncologist may think that. Not always the case. Sometimes it's from the treatment. So always beware. Another important concept is if, you're, if you have had diabetes or you're pre-diabetic, if you will, these drugs can escalate blood sugar. So it's important to record them more frequently for at least the first five days to get a sense of this as an issue. And it can be sneaky. It can sneak up in time. So if you're on these treatments and you're finding yourself thirstier than usual, you're peeing more than usual, you're more fatigued, you're losing weight, Remember that blood sugar elevation can be important. It's really important to discuss it with your GP or nurse practitioner as well as your oncologist to make sure that this doesn't become a sneaky issue for you that requires management. And for some patients, it's very important. And finally, a vague sense of feeling off. I don't know how better to describe it. It's not usually due to blood sugar or anything we can measure. It's a, usually a transient sensation lasting a day or two, very unclear reasons. It's kind of motherhood advice or fatherhood advice. I advise patients just to rest and go slow and try and go with it. It's very uncommon for this to become a progressive issue and usually does not develop into anything serious at all. So with that, um, what's next if disease or the syndrome progresses? So many times we talk about escalating the SSA. With LAR or sandostatin LAR, that usually means an increased dose. And with lanreotide, that means shortening the schedule from every four weeks to every two weeks. Based on our previous discussion, remember that anytime we increase SSAs, you have to be watch out for worsened diarrhea as a possibility and not to confuse it with worsening syndrome. 
if it's helpful, it usually is from our perspective, relatively short term help. So the average duration of disease control is about eight months. And there's also the risk of increased discomfort with LAR that usually means two shots rather than one shot a month and inconvenience with lanreotide. Now you're getting shot every two weeks rather than every four weeks. So it may not be a great long-term solution and maybe help us bridge to the next treatment possibility. A new treatment for patients with worsen syndrome is telotristat, which you may have heard about. This is one pill taken three times a day, very well tolerated without significant side effects with the sole goal is really to decrease diarrhea for patients experiencing uh, inadequate control on somatostatin analog treatment. It's a treatment that's added to the needles, not instead of. And about 40% of patients have a durable benefit with significant reduction in diarrhea and a reduction in 5-HIAA. Usually those that will benefit, it's very quick. Within a couple of months, people know. There is no anti-cancer effect. It's very important. It's really just to control symptoms, but an option to discuss with your oncologist if you have carcinoid syndrome with bad diarrhea despite SSA. So the next topic, next type of treatments involve pill forms of treatments. And many of you are familiar with these medicines. One's called Everlimus or Affinitor, the other Sunitinib or Sutent. These are what we call targeted treatments. I wish they were more targeted than they were, but they're once daily when they are, but they're once daily pills. And again, the same goals, prolong disease stability or to stabilize disease that is progressing. Tumor shrinkage rates are again quite low, less than 10%. And there are new options on the horizon, but I'm gonna focus on the two here that are the ones most commonly used. So Everlimus or Affinitor can be well tolerated, but mouth sores can be an issue. Usually if you're gonna be sensitive to it, it's within the first two to six weeks. There are remedies, salt water rinses, baking soda rinses. In oncology, we have a lot of these things called magic mouthwashes. They're not so magical to be honest, but they can help some patients. And in worst case scenarios, we have a rinse that involves steroids that can help with this. So can be an issue, it needs to be actively managed. Fatigue, rash, and diarrhea can also be problems for some patients. Obviously resting with fatigue is important. Low dose topical steroid creams over the counter can help with the rash sometimes and Imodium, which you can get over the counter can help with the diarrhea. But when you combine all these side effects and although they could be, can be quite low grade, if they're persistent and long lasting, they can really interfere with your quality of life. Some of these or sometimes all of them can be prevented by starting this medicine at a lower dose than what is usually done. So five milligrams rather than 10 and then re-escalating if tolerance is excellent. Again, an option to discuss. An important side effect that can be sneaky involves the lungs. So Everlimus can cause potentially serious inflammation in the lungs that requires an urgent stopping of treatment and a course of steroids. And the symptoms are, as you might expect, cough, shortness of breath, or wheezing. It can mimic pneumonia, it can mimic asthma. So it's important to know that this can happen. It usually slowly progresses over a few weeks and it can happen randomly after many months of treatment. It's not an allergic reaction and not something that happens right from the start. So it's very important to know about it and to report any new symptoms along that in that domain. Like SSAs, Everlimus can also drive blood sugars up even without pre-existing diabetes. So if you start having symptoms like I've discussed previously, it's important to remember, uh, could it be my sugar? get it checked and then get it managed if that's the case. As well, it can cause a slight risk of strange infections, but that's usually not a big of an issue uh, in our patient population. Sunitinib uh, is another one of our pill-based therapies. The most one of the common side effects it can cause is hand foot syndrome. And I, you see the pictures here, usually within the first weeks, although it can happen months after starting treatment. I describe it to patients as getting a sunburn in the second most unlikely areas that you might expect, palms of hands, soles of feet. It's very important the skin becomes very sensitive. So if you're a walker or a hiker, you have to make sure your shoes fit properly, your socks aren't rubbing, and you may have to modify your activities. Really important to have moisture, great moisturizing. We oftentimes recommend utter cream or eucerin, slathering constantly to try and minimize this. 
Sunitinib can also drive up blood pressure, so it's important to optimize blood pressure before starting, and you may need more frequent monitoring if you're treated for hypertension, especially in the first few months, to make sure that uh, your, your antihypertensives can be adjusted. And sunitinib, unfortunately, does have a risk of blood clots, and that can happen at any time. So any sudden pain or swelling in one leg, any sudden shortness of breath or chest pain while you're on it, that means a trip to the emergency room to get assessed and make sure that you don't have a blood clot problem that can be easily treated uh, and very important not to be missed. It can be very tiring uh, for some patients, but also causes problems with the thyroid. So sometimes fatigue is due to low thyroid. So it's important to know that so that your family physician or your oncologist will check your thyroid as you go forward, because it's very easy to fix that with some thyroid replacement. And finally, uh, many patients over, if they're on sunitinib for quite a bit of time, will report that their skin changes and especially their hair can become silver or gray. It's not just necessarily because you're getting older. Uh, sunitinib can cause a silvering of hair and some skin depigmentation. And you have the pictures there. So just last couple of minutes here, turning to chemotherapy. Most of us have an image of what chemotherapy is. Thankfully for neuroendocrine tumors, uh, that really isn't the case. And that's due to a treatment called CAPTEM, which is some familiar, I think, to many of you and is become increasingly the first line chemotherapy we, we turn to if we need if a patient needs chemo. The best evidence are for, is for those with neuroendocrine tumors of surviving from the pancreas, but it's often considered for a wide variety of patients if disease is clearly progressing and especially if there's an impending threat to health. And you can see with this picture, there are two medicines, capecitabine in purple, given every day for 14 days. I wish it was just one pill. It usually ends up being two or three pills twice a day for the 14 days. And the last five days, temozolomide. So it's a lot of pills. Now, what's uh, incredible about this particular regimen, and I'm just going to very briefly show you here, is that if you look in the purple circle, that's the risk of blood problems. And if you look in the red circle, those are the risks of other problems that can interfere with quality of life, like mouth sores, fatigue, diarrhea, nausea. And you see that the range is less than 3% basically of significant side effects. So compared to almost all other chemo treatments we use in oncology, CAPTEM tends to be incredibly well tolerated for the majority of patients. The cap part, the capecitabine, though, can cause mouth SARS, diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, and rash, which we've discussed. But the dose we use in this treatment is quite low compared to other areas in oncology, so very uncommon to be significant problems. And all the side effects can be managed by decreasing the dose or changing the schedule. So it's a very flexible chemo program. Extremely rarely, some patients are just unable to eliminate the drug from their system, and those patients are at risk of severe trouble. Now, in my experience, I've not seen it yet, thank goodness, for a patient on this regimen. Um, so it's just something to know about that all these treatments can be associated with severe toxicities, but very unusual uh, for CAPTEM. The TEM part, the temozolomide, the thing that's important to remember is that it can cause nausea and vomiting for sure. So I always recommend and prescribe at the same time Zofran or Ondansetron, which is a very strong anti-nauseant. Patients take a half hour before each dose to last five days. Unfortunately, it can cause constipation and headache. So we need to remind ourselves that that can be a problem from, from the Zofran itself, not necessarily from the chemo drug. And more potential issues with blood counts and blood counts are always checked every month on this regimen. So last slide. You know, this 15 minutes, uh, maybe 20, I apologize if I've gone over, I've only, sp I've only spoken about the first group of treatments, SSA analogs, and the last group, Everlimus, Sunitimum, Captem. But many patients will have multiple surgeries, liver-directed therapies, PRT, and all of these treatments may be relevant for you at some time in your disease journey. At side effect avoidance and active management are key components in helping you live as well as possible with your disease and treatment. And I think it's something to be very in involved with and engaged with, with your oncologist and with your GP or nurse practitioner to try and make sure things go as well as possible for you as you get your treatment. Thank you very much. And I hope this has been helpful.